decisions made by the seven justices who sit on the Ohio Supreme Court here in Columbus affect the quality of life of every resident of the Buckeye State. The court hears appeals from the lower courts throughout Ohio to see if the rulings made comply with current state law. There are three seats on the court up for election this fall. In one of the races, Justice Yvette McGee Brown, the only Democrat on the court, faces Sharon Kennedy, a judge from Butler County, who's a Republican. McGee Brown was appointed justice in 2011, the first African American to hold that title. She served as a Franklin County Domestic Relations Juvenile Judge, helped create a family drug court, then left the bench to form the Center for Child and Family Advocacy at Nationwide Children's Hospital. There's been a lot of discussion lately about judges legislating from the bench, effectively rewriting the laws that the legislature has previously written. How do you feel about that issue? Well, Tony, I think that's improper, and I think with the court that we have today, you don't find that. Our role as the third branch of government is to interpret the law and to apply, apply the law and the Ohio Constitution. We should not be writing policy or writing legislation. That is not the job of the judiciary. And I don't think you will see evidence of that in this current court. We are a court that understands our role in a constitutional democracy. It is a moderate role, and it's a role to look at what the legislature has done and to opine on that, but not to create new law or policies. During the campaign, voters will be asking you a lot of questions about specific issues. How will you answer these questions so that voters will have the information they need when they go to vote? without violating the Judicial Ethics Code? That's a really great question. One of the things as, as jurists that we have to do is to say to people, we can't answer questions that might appear before the court. I think what you look at is, how are the bar associations rating us? What is our background in terms of judicial experience, private sector experience? What are those things that give you confidence in our ability to judge cases impartially and fairly without regard to any particular ideology or without regard to who the person in front of us is? You want a jurist who comes to you with a broad base of experience, who knows how to interpret the law, understands their role in the court, and who can make fair and unbiased decisions. It's incumbent upon the voters to educate themselves about who the judiciary are and to look at their background and experience and make an informed decision. Many people feel that justice is for sale in Ohio due to the uh, influence of campaign contributions to Supreme Court justices. How can you assure all Ohioans that your decisions will be fair and unbiased in light of the fact that you're accepting money from interest groups that expect you to vote their way? Well, Brett, um, I can honestly tell you that oftentimes I don't know who's contributing to my campaign. We have separate campaign committees who do fundraising for us. And when I go out and speak to groups, I make it very clear to them that what they are supporting with me is a justice who brings integrity, intelligence, and impartiality to the bench. And so we have um, contribution limits that are meant to minimize that perception that you talk about. We have under Ohio Constitution a process of electing judges and as long as judges are required to be elected we have to have a means of getting our message to the voters which includes being able to send direct mail and do media and so paying for commercials are expensive no one should believe that by getting a comp campaign contribution it's influencing how a jurist is going to vote our campaign committees have that Chinese wall between us where they do their fundraising jurisdiction are not allowed to ask for money directly, I think that's appropriate because you want to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. I couldn't tell you whether somebody who appears in front of the court has contributed to my campaign. What I can tell you is that when I'm looking at a case, I am looking at what's the legal issue and I'm doing my best to apply the law to that issue. Um, voters have to have confidence in that, and people choose to support people that they identify with who they think share their values. There's, that, there's nothing you can do about that in an elective system, but there is no justice for sale. I don't believe any of my colleagues are making decisions based on who gives them a contribution. When it comes to sentencing, which do you prefer, judicial discretion or minimum mandatory sentencing? 
Well, Gail, that's an easy one for me. I prefer judicial discretion. Throughout my judicial career, I have gone to the legislature and testified against mandatory sentencing because I believe the third branch has to preserve certain authority to itself. And the reason you have jurists is that you want a judge, when they're looking at your case, to make decisions about who you are and not have to just apply mandatory minimums. So, for example, if someone you love gets in trouble, you want a judge to be able to consider this is their first offense, they had some horrific life experience, they have a supportive family and community, and not simply have to give everybody a set sentence, regardless of the circumstances. I believe when you have mandatory sentences, you don't need judges. Just take them to the police station, say, here's your offense, and this is what the sentence is. There is a reason that you have the third branch of government. You want judges who exercise their intelligence based on the facts of the cases as to the appropriate sentences. And we have an electoral process, so if at any time somebody disagrees with how a jurist is imposing sentences, the means to deal with that is to get that jurist out of office. But we have to be very careful about limiting the judiciary's authority. And in fact, you've actually seen that pendulum swing back to the middle. In the 90s, when I was testifying against mandatory minimums, everybody was for it. Let's lock them up and throw away the key. Well, as the economy has declined, and it's become become more expensive to incarcerate people, Governor Kasich has put forth a law that says let's be smart on corrections and has given back authority to judges to keep nonviolent offenders in the community. I think that's the way to go. Give authority to judges to do what judges are trained to do. Look at the facts, look at the defendant, and apply the law. As a Supreme Court Justice, what would you do to ensure that people in poverty, people that are underrepresented, or people that are otherwise disenfranchised have equal access to our justice system? That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. One of the things we're doing now at the Supreme Court is really looking at funding for our courts and to making sure that courts have the resources they need to do their work, including the ability to appoint counsel for those defendants that are indigent. We also are looking at a rule which is currently out for public comment that would allow lawyers to earn CLE credit for pro bono work because we know legal aid is underfunded and understaffed and we want to partner with legal aid and with the Bar Association to make sure that there's access to the courts by people who cannot otherwise afford it because justice becomes illusory if it's not accessible to all people. So that's something that's very important to this court and that the Chief Justice speaks about frequently and that as we go around the state talking with bar associations, we want to support them in that effort as well as legal aid and our public defender's offices. Secondly, I am currently chairing a task force for children in foster care. Nationally, children in foster care only graduate high school at 50 percent and only 3 percent get a baccalaureate degree from a four-year college. We are working now with our state agencies, our department Department of Education, Jobs and Family Services to improve educational outcomes for children who go into foster care. We want to make sure that when we have to remove children from their family that we don't disrupt their educational process and that we give them all the tools they need to be an active participating member of our community when they become adults and not simply start on the treadway to uh, the criminal justice system. It's something very important to me and I think as Supreme Court Justice we have the ability to lead the way as we work with our trial courts and our appellate courts to make sure that all people in our state not only have access to justice, but that the systems that are making decisions about their lives are helping them achieve their full potential, particularly when you're talking about children. There seems to be a philosophical difference of viewpoint on the court about the punishment of juvenile offenders. In your opinion, should juveniles be treated differently from adults in all cases? Do you believe there are some punishments that are just too harsh for juvenile offenders? Wow, Mariana, thank you for that question. Um, Ohio, over 100 years ago, decided that we should have a separate juvenile system, and I believe we should. Children, as the United States Supreme Court has said recently in the decision of Roper versus Graham, is that children don't mature at the same rates as adults. We know that their frontal lobes, which control decision making, are not fully mature until age 26. And so Ohio has created a system where children in the juvenile system are not forever 
never tainted with the sins of what would otherwise be criminal behavior. They are not convicted, they're adjudicated delinquent. But we also have two mechanisms for those juveniles that are determined to be um, too um, violent to keep in the community. So a juvenile who has shown no interest in being rehabilitated, who represents an ongoing threat to the community, those juveniles can receive what we call a serious youthful offender um, designation, which means they have kind of an option where they can start doing their time in a juvenile facility. And if they do well there, and if they're rehabilitated, and if they don't commit any crimes, they can be released at age 21. However, if they go to the juvenile system and they do not rehabilitate, take advantage of treatment and training, and they do commit other offenses in a juvenile facility, they will then at age 21 be transferred to an adult institution to uh, serve the adult portion of their crime. And then Ohio still has, for those juveniles who are 16 or 17 years of age, who commit homicide or use a weapon in the commission of the offense, those juveniles are automatically transferred to the adult system and will receive an adult sanction. So in my opinion, we have preserved what's good about the juvenile system for those people who create delinquent mistakes when they're 13, 14, 15 years old who show that they can be rehabilitated, the system allows them to do that. For those juveniles where there's a question about whether they can be rehabilitated, they receive that hybrid sentence, which gives them a chance to prove to the court that they can be successfully rehabilitated and move successfully into society. And for those juveniles who at 16 or 17, or even 14 or 15, who demonstrate that they are so violent that they cannot be safely rehabilitated or safely maintained in the community. Ohio allows courts to transfer them to the adult system. I think that's the appropriate blend, understanding that juveniles should be given different consideration than adults. Ohio currently elects its judges, but many people feel they should be appointed by the governor or a nonpartisan committee. What do you feel is better for the community and why? Well, Stacy, right now, Ohio's Constitution requires that our judges be elected, and so that's what I support. Voters have not changed the Constitution. In fact, in 1984 or 86, when it was last on the ballot, it was resoundingly defeated. So what I would say to you is this. No system is perfect. Um, there are states that appoint their, their judges, and there are states like Arizona who have a bipartisan commission made mostly of lay people who evaluate those candidates who want to serve in the judiciary. Chief Justice Tom Moyer, before he died, planned to spend his retirement years really focused on how we select at least Supreme Court justices in this state. His death was a great tragedy for many reasons, but one was because he was going to have, I think, the moral authority to talk about that issue across the state. Really, if Ohio's Constitution is going to change, it's going to have to come from outside the judiciary, I believe. Citizens are going to have to really mount a movement and say, we want to look critically at this issue, look at how other states do it, and decide how we want to select our jurors. At this point, though, Ohio's Constitution requires election, and I follow Ohio's Constitution. We still have a foreclosure crisis in Ohio. It's been five years since the Supreme Court took the initiative to encourage attorneys across the state to represent homeowners in foreclosure cases, and also to set up mediation programs in the counties. What will you do to review how that process has worked and to strengthen it going forward? Well, you know, at the court, we're very fortunate to have a great team of staff who often bring recommendations forward to us. One of the things that we do regularly is evaluate specialty programs like that to determine does the need for them still exist? Should we expand them? Should we add additional resources to them? What I would tell you is that this court is very focused on helping our trial courts and helping citizens who are caught in situations, whether it's foreclosure, mental health courts, veterans courts, family drug courts, substance abuse courts. What I would commit to you is what we have already done, and that is when there is a need identified, like there was with foreclosure, that we send our team in to work with local trial courts to really support them in their efforts to serve the community, to meet the needs of both the banks and individuals, to make sure that justice can be responsive and that it can be quick. And so you can count on us continuing in those efforts. The office of the Ohio Supreme Court is a highly influential position. I'd like to know three things about justices who are running for the Supreme Court. Number one, 
what has been your greatest accomplishment in administering justice? Number two, what has been your opponent's greatest accomplishment in administering justice? And number three, what has been the Ohio Supreme Court's greatest accomplishment in administering justice? Wow, John. <laughs> Well, let me first start by saying um, I don't know that I can identify my greatest accomplishment um, in administering justice. I will tell you two things that I'm particularly proud of. One is that I started when I was a trial court judge in Franklin County on the Domestic Relations and Juvenile Court. I started a, a truancy intervention program called SMART because one of the things I learned is that children who went to school every day did not appear in front of me for violent felonies. And so I started working with our Columbus City Schools in a, one school at a time, ultimately 42 schools before I left the bench in 2002, but on a very simple concept. When children missed five days of school, they received a letter from me having them meet with my court social worker with their parents to understand that education is compulsory in Ohio and that you need to send your children to school and offering resources for those families or helping children get out of situations that were not safe for them. It's one of my proudest accomplishments. Also, I helped start the family drug court for Franklin County Juvenile Court. I'm very proud to be the first African-American woman to serve on the Supreme Court of Ohio um, and I'm very proud of my record of of really not only administering justice, deciding cases, but also really working to help those children who have been caught in our foster care system around this state. As for my opponent, I, I can't tell you what her proudest accomplishment is in all candor, and I mean no disrespect by that, I just simply don't know. I'll let her answer that question for you. If you're elected as justice, will you make your decisions based on your political affiliation or what you feel is best for the people of Ohio? That is an excellent question, and I will only make decisions that I believe the law and the Constitution require. What's most important to me as a jurist on this court is that when people evaluate my record, and let's face it, when you're on the Ohio Supreme Court, history will evaluate you, is that I want people to say that I was a really good justice who applied the law fairly and followed Ohio's Constitution. So I am not representing any political ideology on the court. I am not not representing any constituency on the court. I am a justice for all the people of this state. I am doing what the Constitution demands, and that is to apply the law fairly with our out regard to person or party, and to make sure that those decisions are the best that they can be within my understanding of what the law and the Constitution requires. That's the oath I take, and that is, I assure you, what I will do. Hi, I am Yvette McGee Brown, and I'm currently a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. I was appointed to the court January 1st, 2011. I'm the first African American woman to serve on the Supreme Court of Ohio in our 208 year history. I am so honored to be a member of this court. I'm currently the only Democrat on the seven member court, but what I think is phenomenal is that my colleagues and I, when we come to the bench, we are not bringing a political ideology. We don't decide cases based on party. We all decide cases based on the law. I'm honored to be a member of this court. We are seven people who work very hard to apply the law to the facts of the case and to uphold the Ohio Constitution. I am really asking for your support on November 6th. I think this is a court that you can be proud of, that does not legislate from the bench, that understands what our role in a constitutional democracy is, and I am proud to be a member. Thank you very much. Don't forget that the deadline to register to vote in Ohio is October 9th. It's your right to cast your vote for the person that you'd like to see in office. Tom McKee, 9 News at the Ohio Supreme Court in Columbus.